What's up, good morning to you. This is Tacky Ty. Today we are looking at another episode of Epic History TV. This is The Road to Leipzig from Napoleon Bonaparte in 1813. Again, as always, be sure to check out the original link down in the description down below for the original content creators. Give them the love and support that they well deserve. Also, if you have any other future video topics that you'd like to watch together, be sure to let me know down in the comments below. Let me also know your thoughts about these different... Now he's on the back foot. So, I mean, it, kind of the, the tide of, of war has shifted. And now Napoleon's in a position that he's not quite used to. But yeah, let's jump into it. What a career Napoleon has ruined. Having gained so much glory, he could bestow peace on Europe, but he has not done so. 1812 had been a disastrous year for Napoleon. His invasion of Russia had led to the almost total destruction of an army of half a million men. Now Poland and Germany were wide open to Russian attack. And that's largely like his core army, like the Grand Armée. Like Some advised Emperor Alexander troops. that this was the time to make a favourable peace with Napoleon. Russia's own armies had been mauled, and Western Russia devastated. But Alexander was determined to see Napoleon defeated for good, to free Europe from his clutches, and, and avenge Moscow's destruction by taking Paris. Napoleon's allies were deserting him. I mean, that would be the time to make a favorable peace, but I mean, if you see that window of opportunity and like considering the losses that Russia has endured time after time again from Napoleon now, I mean, it's it's within their right to want revenge. Russian I mean, troops they, they had they already agreed Moscow. a truce with the Russians. Schwarzenberg's corps marched back to Austria which assumed a policy of watchful neutrality. Napoleon had left Marshal Murat in charge of the remnants of the Murat. army. I mean, Murat's been there for a long time. He's been through it for since the beginning, really. King but he Naples. left for the Kingdom of Naples, hoping to cut a deal with the Allies that would let him keep his throne. Yeah, he, now he's, he's trying to protect his own. Because, I mean, it, he's fairly new to the King... Kingdom of Naples as well, and now he just wants to retain it because he sees Napoleon's like running with his tail between his legs to try to build another army in time. He was replaced by Napoleon's stepson Eugène, who'd proved himself a brave and able soldier in Russia, Eugène. but was unused to independent command, and now faced odds of four to one. As Russian forces advanced through Poland, he continued to retreat west, leaving garrisons to hold strategic fortresses. And the Russian generals are, are smart. Most of which were soon besieged. It's a worthy adversary. On the 7th of February, Russian troops entered Warsaw unopposed. Napoleon's Polish client state, the Duchy of Warsaw, effectively ceased to exist. Wow. I mean, that was really kind of their their best attempt to bring back Poland after those multiple series of basically annexations, but in history they're called partitions. Three weeks later, Russian troops entered Berlin, while Sweden joined the Allies. Oh. Wow. Yeah, it looks like he Sweden was, just kind was of angry. ruled by Napoleon's former Marshal Bernadotte, yeah, Bernadotte, now officially known as Crown Prince Karl Johann. Many would accuse him of betraying Napoleon, but he'd always been clear that once he became Sweden's crown prince, he'd pursue Swedish interests, which is what he now claimed to do. I mean, at least he, like, he was up front with it from the start, even though I'm sure it, it kind of was a bitter... I'm sure it stunned on Napoleon's side, though. In exchange for Norway, to be taken from France's ally, Denmark, and one million pounds from Britain. Bernadotte agreed to join what was now the sixth coalition against France since the revolution, 
with an army of 30,000 troops. That's rough though, because I mean, Bernadotte has almost uncanny like insight to the inner workings of how Napoleon's army, being served of like one of the top commanders in his army for so long, I mean, he, he knows them intimately. 10 days later, King Frederick William of Prussia declared war on France. It Russia's followed back, weeks yeah. of indecision. The king was widely seen as a weak character and terrified of Napoleon. Yeah, but, and that's probably why, because he, if there's enough other allies in it, he wants to try to get some glory too and, and really just earn the respect of his citizenry and cabinet, I'm sure. Just because it is Prussia, they do have their reputation to uphold. But with guarantees of Russian military support, the return of lost territory, and enormous financial and material aid from Britain, he agreed to field an army of 80,000 men. It's a big gamble on the, 17th though, on the Prussian side, because if he loses, like they've been beaten multiple times, and he'd probably, like, he could potentially lose his crown uh, just because he's already seen as a weak leader at the time. On the 15th of March, he issued a proclamation to the people of Prussia and Germany, and mein Volk, to my people, summoning them to fight for Prussia and Germany's honour in what would soon be known as the German War of Liberation. The Prussian army had been greatly reformed since its humiliating defeat to Napoleon in 1806. Yeah, and all these different allies have learned a lot. Because at the beginning, when Napoleon took power, like he kind of changed the game as far as how tactics worked. And now all, everyone's kind of grown wiser from that. And now they've largely implemented the same, same systems. Especially a military commission headed by General von Scharnhorst had sacked nearly 200 old generals and abolished flogging, expanded recruitment and introduced exams for officers, hmm. and overhauled training, tactics and drill. When Napoleon met the new Prussian army in battle two months later, he remarked, these animals have learned something. Small consolation, they'd learned yeah. most of it from him. Yeah. This Defeat is a cruel teacher. As his enemies massed in Germany, Napoleon was in Paris, working tirelessly to build a new army with which to face them. 137,000 new conscripts joined the army, and laws passed to call up 100,000 more, while 40,000 veterans from the army in Spain, 16,000 Marines, and 80,000 men of the National Guard, a home defense force. Wow, that's impressive that he was able to be beaten so bad, lose most of his army, and come back and conscript so many men. I mean, they've got to be heavily depleting their man, their manpower resources here. Were transferred to Germany. It's probably their last muster of conscription. The new conscripts were nicknamed Marie Louises, after Napoleon's young wife, who passed the new conscription laws in his absence. They were young and raw. Two thirds were teenagers, and there was a severe lack of experienced officers and NCOs. In short, the countless irreplaceable veterans now lying beneath Russian soil. There was also a critical shortage of cavalry, a crisis mocked by British satirists. It would take Napoleon longer to replace the many thousands of horses and trained horsemen who perished in Russia. Yeah, I, I didn't quite think of that like that. That's a major part of your army. And if you don't have cavalry and the enemy does, I mean, it's, it doesn't prone, like it's not clear at the time, but when you're in battle and you don't have your cav, like you feel it. When Napoleon left Paris for Germany in mid-April, 
the French situation was precarious. Eugène had been forced back behind the river Elbe to the fortified city of Magdeburg. Dresden, the capital of Saxony, had fallen to the Prussians. The Duchy of Mecklenburg-Schwerin became the first German state to defect from Napoleon's Confederation of the Rhine. Russian Cossacks raided as far as Hamburg, inspiring local revolts against French occupying forces. Meanwhile, Austria stood on the sidelines, so far declining to back either side. Well, I mean, that's, that's probably wise on their side, because, I mean, they've been the instigator multiple times and just, like, very amped to jump in, and then they get beat back countless times. It's like, okay, now, now they're a little bit more cautious. Let the Allies and other people do something first, take the initiative, and then they'll just observe from the sideline. And when the time is right, I'm sure they'll, if the, the, the winds are on their side, they'll probably jump in. Napoleon's miraculous feat of organization meant he now had more than 200,000 troops in Germany. Wow. And the emperor's personal magnetism was undimmed. The morale of his yeah, army sure. was high. I mean, he's like the most famous person like in Europe at the time. The so Russians, celebrity. on the other hand, yeah. lost their iconic commander, Field Marshal oh, Kutuzov, yeah. to pneumonia on the 28th of April. Wow. And he's been through it for a long time too. Like he's seen it through thick and thin from the beginning. And what a way to go too. I mean, illness, disease, pneumonia. I mean, that's largely the fate of a, at least a good third of your army. His role was taken over by General Wittgenstein. Russian troops were exhausted and far from home. Their army weakened by the need to contain French garrisons across Poland and Germany. Mm. Russia and Sweden had yet to fully mobilize their strength, and Allied forces barely mustered 100,000 men. Wow. See, that's crazy that Napoleon was able to conscript so much men and all of these different allies together largely don't have that many men at arms here. I mean, for being, yeah, I mean, that, it's just surprising. They were now heavily outnumbered by Napoleon, and the French emperor decided to strike quickly. He ordered Marshal Davout to Hamburg with 35,000 men to secure his northern flank. He would march against the Russian and Prussian forces converging on Leipzig to force a decisive battle. Victory would make Austria think twice about joining the Allies, allow him to rescue the 90,000 men trapped in garrisons across Germany and Poland, and re-establish his dominance over Europe. Yeah, because he needs a quick and decisive win to just kind of send the signal out to everybody like, hey, this is what happens if you go toe-to-toe -to -toe with me, like, stay put. <laughs> As Napoleon advanced on Leipzig, the Allies faced a predicament. To risk battle against Napoleon's larger army, or give up Germany without a fight, a potentially devastating blow to Allied morale and any chance of winning Austria over to their cause. Allied headquarters made the bold decision to attack. They knew most of Napoleon's army was made up of raw conscripts that their own troops were better trained and had a great superiority in cavalry and artillery. Yeah, because yeah, Napoleon lost a lot of cannon too on his retreat, just stuck in the mud and snow, which I'm sure largely they commandeered. The Allies agreed over. that as Napoleon crossed the Sarla River, they would hit his right flank before he could concentrate the full mass of his forces. The two armies were on a collision course. 
but Napoleon's shortage of cavalry meant he lacked information about Allied movements. Oh, yeah. Scout. On the 1st of May, Marshal Bessières, commanding the cavalry in Murat's absence, was carrying out reconnaissance himself when he was hit by a cannonball and killed instantly. Wow. Bessières was the second of the... Especially for a marshal. Marshal scouting out ahead. Random cannonball just nails you in the shoulder. Wow. Bolian's marshals to be killed in action. And like wow. Lan, an old comrade and trusted friend. The Allies were able to surprise Napoleon, falling on Marshal Ney's 3rd Corps near Lutzen. Ney's troops had to cling on in the face of a Russian and Prussian onslaught, while Napoleon rapidly redirected his other corps to fall on the enemy's flanks. At one stage, Napoleon had to personally help rally routing troops as they broke in the face of determined Prussian assaults. Because yeah, he has fret, he has some greenhorns, so he, he has to rally them, keep their morale up so they don't just run away. But on the whole, his young conscripts fought with courage. And despite hours of savage fighting, Wittgenstein could not exploit his early advantage. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a brutal, I mean, to go from a fresh conscript into Leipzig, I mean, that, like, that's <laughs> straight into the frying pan. As French reinforcements arrived, the battle turned against him. Towards dusk, the Allies were forced to break off the engagement. Though they'd inflicted around 22,000 casualties, losing just half as many men. General von Scharnhorst, mortally wounded, was among them. Crucially, Napoleon's lack of cavalry meant he was unable to pursue the enemy, who retreated in good order. Well, and that's going to be a major dilemma, basically from this point forward, is because if he, if he wins a pitch battle just through numbers alone and they start to rout, he can't pursue them to actually capitalize on that victory. So they could just constantly keep falling back and re regathering later to fight another day. So it's just a never ending battle then where he has to continually win every single battle because he won't be able to run out, run away because they'll be able to catch him on horseback. Expecting the Prussians to fall back on Berlin Napoleon sent Marshal Ney in pursuit, while he continued east. But the Allied army stayed together, withdrawing to a defensive position at Bautzen, deliberately close to the Austrian border, hoping to entice Schwarzenberg to intervene, and daring Napoleon to violate Austrian neutrality. Well, Neither happened. Strategy. Instead, Napoleon ordered Ney to swing south, to fall on the Allies' northern flank, while he... Because, I mean, Napoleon knew that he didn't want to cross into Austrian territory, because that would basically be a Casabelli, and give him some kind of prompt to actually join. But, like, this is probably the, one of the most important battles, at the moment at least, just because if he loses, then that will prompt Austria to join. If, and if he wins, then that'll, they'll, they'll be all the wiser. Not he launched a frontal assault to pin them in place. The battle lasted two days, as French infantry struggled forward against the Prussian and Russian lines. But a misunderstanding over Ney's orders caused a delay that allowed the Allies to narrowly escape Napoleon's trap. Once more, the Allies fought with great determination and inflicted many more losses than they suffered. There were more casualties during the pursuit, including the next day General Duroc, Grand Marshal of the Palace, responsible for Napoleon's personal arrangements, and his closest surviving friend. Riding with Napoleon's staff, a freak cannon shot ricocheted off a tree 
and disemboweled him. His slow, painful death deeply upset Napoleon. Wow, that's rough, and especially to lose all of your friends one by one, basically in front of you. Just... The Emperor continued Sorry. his pursuit to Breslau, once again hindered by his lack of experienced cavalry, while Oudinot was sent north to take Berlin, but was held at Luckau by von Bülow's Prussian Corps. On the 2nd of June, with both sides strained to breaking point, neutral Austria proposed a ceasefire, which to the surprise of many, oh. Napoleon accepted. Wow. That's interesting for Austria to be like, hey, you guys should stop fighting. Just stop. And Napoleon's like, all right. My eagles are again victorious, but my star is setting. So he knows that things are kind of coming unraveling. The armistice of Plaswitz would last more than two months, a period a of intense time. diplomacy and military mobilization by both sides. A long time for campaigns. Napoleon wanted time to rebuild his cavalry, a shortage of which had allowed the Allies to escape twice. Yeah. But he also wanted... realized that's a major weakness in his thing, because he can't, like, he can't pursue a routed enemy. enemy. ...to keep Austria on side which he feared might join the Allies with 200,000 troops, even though Emperor Francis I was now his father-in-law, since Napoleon's marriage to his daughter, Marie-Louise, in 1810. Hmm. Austrian gone. Foreign Minister Clemens von Metternich, who'd become one of 19th century Europe's most influential statesmen, now took center stage. Metternich wanted peace, and to see Austria restored as a great European power, which meant Napoleon contained, but not crushed, which would hand too much power to Russia. In June, he travelled to Dresden to ask Napoleon to make concessions, while promising the Allies that if he did not, Austria would join them. But Napoleon dismissed Metternich's terms out of hand. He would not return the Illyrian provinces to Austria, agree to the repartition of Poland, or the breakup of the Confederation of the Rhine. All were out of the question. Napoleon famously threw his hat to the ground in fury. Peace and war lie in your majesty's hands, Metternich is said to have warned him. Today you can still make peace. Tomorrow it may be too late. But Napoleon preferred war. Yeah, I mean, that's that's just who he is. Like he he's that militant risk taker. What he called a humiliating peace. Yeah, and that, that's true though. I mean, he fought so hard for these previous victories just to add on, on a whim, give it all up for a weak peace. On the 12th so of August, 1813, so many, many Austria died. joined the Sixth Coalition and declared war on France. But that's the alternative too. The Allies... It could have potentially saved everything, because it would keep Austria out of the war. I mean, like, what is... Like, you're, you're looking at today onward, not the glory of yesterday, and uh, to avenge anything, really now had a numerical advantage of three to two. Yeah. And a new strategy, the Trachenberg plan. So now he, now he has to watch a whole new, new front too, because Austria is very well positioned to flank him, and he's outnumbered. Recognizing Napoleon's genius, the Allies would avoid battle with the Emperor and instead target his marshals 
threaten his flanks oh. and wear down French forces, until it was time to close in for the kill. That's pretty smart on their side though, because they realize, they're like, okay, we keep getting our butt kicked from Napoleon. Let's just slowly erode his force, bit by bit. Over the next few months, the coalition would also receive massive material support from Britain, including yeah. £8 million pounds in silver and gold coin, 200 cannon with transport, 120,000 firearms, 18 million rounds of ammunition, 23,000 barrels of gunpowder, 30,000 swords and sabres, 150,000 uniforms, 175,000 pairs of boots, 1.5 million pounds of beef, biscuit and flour, and 28,000 gallons of rum and brandy. Yeah, I mean, Britain's not in the war, like, too much, but, like, they are a strong ally. Even though they don't have much men, like, in it, except for, like, if some down in Spain, uh, but they... They're very supportive. The total value of British aid to the coalition in 1813 was 11.3 million pounds. Today, worth around half a billion dollars. Very Napoleon, best meanwhile, had turned Dresden in into a major Napoleon. supply depot and strengthened his cavalry arm, though it remained a pale shadow of its glorious past. Murat returned to lead it his secret approach to the Allies having been rebuffed. But when news arrived of King Joseph's disastrous defeat to Wellington's Anglo-Spanish-Portuguese army at the Battle of Vitoria, Napoleon had to send Marshal Soult, one of his best commanders, to salvage the situation. Yeah, and, and Marshal Soult has been there for a long time too. On the 15th of August, Napoleon left Dresden and advanced against what he considered the most urgent threat, the joint Prussian-Russian army of Silesia, commanded by General Gebhard von Blücher, soon to win the nickname Marshal Vorwärts, Marshal Forwards, for his aggressive leadership. But Blücher followed the new plan and retreated when he learned of Napoleon's advance. Nepo well, that's smart of him to, I mean, stick to the plan, and I mean, even though it goes against his, his nickname, what he's known for, but... Napoleon then received news from Marshal Sancerre, holding Dresden with 20,000 men, that Schwarzenberg's gigantic army of Bohemia was approaching, and the city and its supplies were in danger. Napoleon left Marshal Macdonald to keep an eye on Blücher, and raced back to Dresden, sending Van Damme's first corps to threaten Schwarzenberg's communications. By the time the Allied assault began, enough reinforcements had arrived to fight off the attack. The next day, despite being heavily outnumbered, Napoleon ordered a counterattack. Struggling through mud and heavy rain, Marshal Murat's advance, supported by Victor's second corps, broke the Allied left flank and took 13,000 prisoners. Wow, that is impressive. That's that's a good victory just on its own. Allies had suffered a disastrous defeat because they'd ignored their own rule don't take on Napoleon in battle. But news soon arrived that turned the situation on its head. Marshal Oudinot had resumed his advance on Berlin with 66,000 men, but in three days of heavy combat around Grossbiren, he was defeated by Bernadotte's Army of the North. Some of the most savage fighting was between Napoleon's Saxon allies and von Bülow's Prussians, two German states that for now remained on opposing sides. Three days later, at the Katzbach River, Blücher... Yeah, and now that Bernadotte is in it, I mean, he's... 
He, he's a skilled tactician. Uh, inflicted a crushing defeat on Marshal Macdonald, driving some French troops into the river itself. Macdonald lost 30,000 men, three eagles and a hundred guns, for Blücher's 22,000 casualties. Three days after Napoleon's victory at Dresden, as Van Damme's corps pursued the Allies, it became trapped in wooded valleys around Kulm and was overrun. General Van Damme himself was dragged from his horse by Cossacks, as he and 10,000 of his men were made prisoner. Napoleon sent Ney to take over from Udino, who engaged Bülow's Prussian corps at Denewitz. The Prussians, fighting to save Berlin, held their own, until Russian and Swedish reinforcements arrived to turn the battle decisively in the Allies' favour. Ney's retreat became a rout, with the loss of another 22,000 men. Yeah, it's tough to keep that discipline, especially on new conscripts, where to do an organised retreat while still fighting a rear guard and keeping that discipline in order and not have it turn into a rout. Napoleon's brilliant victory at Dresden had been completely overturned in just 10 days. The Allied plan was working. Napoleon became increasingly frustrated as Allied armies withdrew wherever he advanced and advanced wherever he was not. His teenage conscripts were exhausted by constant marching and famished as Saxony had been stripped bare of supplies. Thousands fell sick, thousands more deserted. Russian and Prussian light troops were now operating behind Napoleon's army, harassing his communications with France. Yeah, see, and that'd be tough too. I mean, it's new again, new, new, fresh troops, man. And just to like, if there's a way to like have a decoy, like, like Napoleon double, to try and trick him and keep him out so you can actually have a pitch battle with someone rather than them just constantly pulling back and deciding not to. Many of Napoleon's marshals advised him to pull back to the River Rhine. But Napoleon wasn't giving up Germany without a fight. But they won't fight it. <laughs> By October 1813, Napoleon faced a third of a million Allied troops in Germany, converging on him from three directions. 900 miles away, Field Marshal Wellington was crossing the Bidassoa River into France, the first enemy army on French soil in nearly 20 years, while the Kingdom of Bavaria, a French ally since the days of Austerlitz, had secretly agreed to switch sides and would declare war on France on the 14th of October. Oh. Napoleon planned to defend the line of the River Elbe. But the arrival of General Bennigsen's reserve Russian army freed up Blücher, who suddenly marched to join forces with Bernadotte and forced his way across the Elbe at Wartenberg. Napoleon went north with 150,000 men, seeking the decisive battle that would change his fortunes. But once more, Blücher narrowly escaped him. Then came news from Murat, who'd been left with 67,000 men to cover Schwarzenberg. The enemy had bypassed Dresden, and was heading for Leipzig. If the city fell, Napoleon would be cut off from France. Once more, he was advised to fall back to the Rhine. But instead, Napoleon ordered all his forces to concentrate at Leipzig. He would risk everything in one great battle to decide the fate of his empire 
and the fate of Europe. Wow. I mean, it definitely would be safer to pull back to the Rhine. But I mean, this is how Napoleon became Napoleon, is by putting it all on the line. Everything he's worked for up until this point. Put it all, all on red and spin the wheel. But yeah, let me know your thoughts down below and be sure to check out the original link down in the description down below and I will see you on the next one. Cheers.